Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the inaugural podcast and what hopes to be many more here at the Co-Creative Center in New Bedford. I am your host, Seamus Galligan, and we're coming out of the gate strong here with a very interesting and fascinating first guest. Brian Francis Culkin is a writer, film director, and theorist. He has written extensively about topics ranging from contemporary urban gentrification to the history of boxing, the presidency of Donald Trump to analysis of 21st century capitalism, heroin addiction in American society to the culture of Boston, Massachusetts, the ideology of neoliberal globalization, Amazonian plant medicine, and contemporary cinema. He is the author of 10 books, including The Meaning of Trump, The Ayahuasca Dialogues, and his forthcoming first novel, Into the Jungle. He has also written and directed three films. He is a graduate of Skidmore College in New York, where he was a standout student athlete. He has lived in the Amazon rainforest for over two years, studying plant medicine and the shamanism of the Upper Peruvian Amazon and both the Shipibo and Mestizo traditions. He currently lives between Iquitos, Peru, and Boston, Massachusetts. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. <laughs> so, when Dina mentioned that the Co Creative Center would be launching this podcast series, she inquired as to whether I would be interested. And I think what I appreciate most about this center is the diversity of the community here, and it's uh, it's very easily to be inspired and, and to just uh, you know be forced a little bit outside your comfort zone and to 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 learn. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's always a good thing. That's right. That, uh, That's how we learn, right? We have to go out of, out of our comfort zone. Right. So, your name immediately came to mind as just an interesting and passionate individual who has a wealth of, of knowledge. And I, so I thought one way to start was you are currently splitting time between the jungles of the Amazon and the jungles of Braintree, Massachusetts. <laughs> and can you just speak a little bit to what that's like? Sure. Um, you know, I think, I think first, I don't want to give anyone a false impression that I'm living in the middle of the jungle. I, I do live in the Amazon jungle, but I also live in Iquitos, which is a major, which is the major city of the Peruvian Amazon. It's about a half million people. So it, it is a city for sure. And then I also own land about 20 miles outside of Iquitos and I spend time in there as well. And that is the Amazon proper. Um, so yeah, there's a enormous, enormous difference from... Boston, Braintree, um, and, you know, from America to Peru. And, you know, Iquitos is a very interesting city in Peru. You know, Lima, for instance, this is a major, major global city. And when you're in a neighborhood like Miraflores, which is, you could say, the, the nicest neighborhood of a, of a city like Lima, it's, it's comparable to America. Of course it's not because they speak mm -hmm. Spanish. But, you know, you're walking down the street in Miraflores, you say, ah, oh, I, I could be in Boston right now. I could be in New York. It's... it's you know it's different, but it's not that different. When you're in a place like Iquitos, you're, you know, you're not in Kansas anymore. Let's say it like that. You're in a totally different world. And what's interesting about Iquitos is that it's completely cut off from basically civilization. The only way to get in there is by boat or by plane. You're not driving in there. It's, it's enveloped by the Amazon jungle. So it has a very, very distinct culture. It has a very... I always say it's the worst place in the world to learn Spanish. It's mm -hmm. terrible. It's like learning English on the deep Louisiana bayou. It's just this, this uh, their accent and dialect is, is very, very difficult to, uh, to, um, to speak or learn or, or, or um, anything like that. And um, so, yeah, the, right now, um, I basically live in Peru. I, I live in Iquitos, and I have, like I said, I have, I have land outside of... Iquitos in the jungle, and I come home to visit my family. Um, and I usually come home about a month or so during the summertime, and then from Thanksgiving to Christmas. So I'm here right now. So, it, you know, it's always difficult. Whenever I come back, it takes me about a week or so to get it get adjusted, sure. and particularly now because, you know, Iquitos is, um, it's, it's tropical. It's 90 degrees every single day. And I got off the plane and around Thanksgiving a month ago, and I, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It's cold. It's just a, the the... Everything's so different, so it definitely takes a bit of a toll on your body. But you know, I'm, I'm from Boston, so I, I love coming home to visit, and I like living down in Peru. So it's yeah, it's good. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. And before we get into sort of what 
has led you to call Peru home. I sure. Maybe we could talk a bit about your past and some of the passion pursuits you've had because you've certainly had quite a varied career thus far. You, uh, athlete, author, filmmaker, and I guess choose any of the above and kind of walk us through some of that. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I was... Um, Yes, I was an athlete in college, and I played professionally for about a year or so afterwards. And then I was involved in the business world for several years after that, in my 20s. And then about five or six years ago, I made a conscious decision that I, that I wanted to write. I wanted to be a writer. Um, and I've written a series of books since then. And that's kind of part of the reason of what brought me to Peru, is because the type of writing that I do, um, you know, it's... The, the books that I've written so far, the, the 10 books you mentioned that I'm working on, I'm just about done with my first novel, which is true, but the 10 books that I've written so far, they're all what you could call critiques of society. They're, they're, it's a type of writing that we could term theory. It's um, trying to explain the state of the world. Um, and it's, a, of course, a very confusing time that we're living in right now. And one of the things that I, fi that I find living in a place like Aikido's is that you can look into American culture and see things much better than you were if you were living here. So I, I feel like I have, you know, living in a place like Aikido's in the middle of the Amazon jungle, you have a very interesting viewpoint into the state of the capitalist world, you could say, whether it be America or Europe or, or Asia or anything else. So you can, um, you can see things from a bit of a detached perspective, which allows you to to see how things are fitting together and what's going on. So the, the theme of my writing, I've, I've written about all different things, you know, but the basic theme is a, is a critique of, you could call it globalization or neoliberalism or, um, or late capitalist society, you could say. Um, so that's, so that's, that's kind of what, um, what brought me to Peru, in addition to really liking Peru and the people, was a place I wanted to write from. And then as I started to live there, that's when I got involved in the world of plant medicine and, and began writing about that and experiencing it myself and becoming friends with a whole host of characters. I mean, Aikido's is great because it's a city with so many characters and just so many interesting people, um, you know, just really wonderful people. It's just, a, it's a great palette of life. So it's an interesting place to live for sure. Um, and it's, it's been very, it's been very, uh, you, you, you're never short of ideas living there. Right. I walk down the street and it's just like, it's, I get hit with a new idea for this and that. And, you know, um, I, I, I would definitely like to make a film down there as well at some point. Um, there, there is actually a history of cinema in Iquitos. Um, Iquitos, of course, was a very, very famous city in the late 1800s and the early 1900s because of the rubber trade. It was... Yeah. Iquitos was almost like the Silicon Valley of the 19th century. It was a, it was a city that had a tremendous, tremendous, um, about three decades of growth. And, it, you know, it, in the 1890s and in, in the first decade of the 20th century, rubber was like the, it was like gold. It was the, it was the most important um, um, ingredient to the operation of industrial-based capitalism. So all the factories in Detroit and the factories in Northern England needed this material. And Aikidos is one of the main centers of, in the whole world of, of providing this. So, um, so that's when there, there was a bit of a cinematic community that, that was down there at, at that time. And, and there's actually a famous film directed by Werner Herzog, and I think it came out in like 1981 or 1982, called Fitzcarraldo. It's a story about one of these rubber barons that was, um, there's a street named after him actually in, in Aikidos right now. But it's, um, it's a wonderful film. Um, that gives you a taste of what like, life was like in Iquitos back in the, in the early 20th century. Yeah. Cool. cool. And you sort of skimmed over your athletic background. I think, <laughs> I think we should at least, I think it speaks to a little bit to your personality. You weren't just a, you know, a uh, club basketball player, but you, you had a really nice career at Skidmore. I, mean, I did, yeah. Do you want I don't to like share a little well, bit? Well, I don't like... I, 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 yeah, I, I, was a, I was a pretty good player back in my day. I broke some records in college and had the chance to play overseas a little professionally. And, you know, that, I guess, something like that, you know, when you play when you're young, you know, being a hockey player, mm -hmm. you know, you play competitive at that level when you're young in high school and college and even professionally, 
that type of, it stays with you, where, where you want to do things right, you want to do things, you know, you want to do things good, you want to do things yeah. the right way. Um, and, you know, you know, I, I try not to be competitive in my life right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I try to channel that into more, um, where you want to do things good, you want to be good at things, you want to be, but you don't want to be, uh, go over the top to be the sure. best to, at the expense of other people. So yeah, it's one of those things where you want to channel it in a way that's productive, but not be, uh, I mean, I, I was ruthless when I played basketball. Sure. I was very cutthroat and, and maybe not, you know, so I, I don't want to be like that anymore. But driven? Yeah. Driven, 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 definitely, definitely driven. Um, you know, just, you know, I've written 10 books over the past five years, so that takes some drive to do that, sure. you know? And then I have several more that I'm working on right now. So yeah, there's, there's a focus that you get from playing sports that's helpful in, in all types of things, whether it's business or art or writing or, or anything. Um, it makes you say, okay, I want to do this, and then you got to take these steps to do it, and then, then you push yourself to do it, right. you know? Right. Yeah. I think another interesting thing that you've touched upon is, you know, your reason for moving was to write. And I think something that I've thought about is that as artists or it could be anybody, but this taking this proactive approach and putting yourself in the right environment to do the things that you want to do. And I think in particular in your situation, uh, you know, separating yourselves from probably a lot of distraction. Sure. You know, and, uh, you know, to write and to write well, to set aside, set aside time each day to do yeah. so. And can you speak? Well, I, I think by definition, a, a good artist or a good, um, a good writer or a good you know, anybody who's engaging in something that's creative, they, they, they have to be on the outside of things a little bit. And it's actually similar to a shaman. You know, a, a, a good shaman is never like in the community. Mm-hmm. He's on the outside of the community looking in. Um, you know, if, if you look at all the great artists historically, um, take someone like Manet, who's the founder of modern art. I mean, he grew up in a bourgeois family in Paris and his father was a judge, I think. and. You know, for him to be to do what he did artistically, he had to go off and hang out with all the, you know, he had, he had to leave the, the particular background he was from to see things f- from a different angle. And I think you'll find that theme in, in so many writers and artists. You have to leave where you're from and go off the beaten path to look in. And of course, there are exceptions to that. I just came to the obvious exception to that in my mind is the American white writer Wendell Berry, who has lived in his hometown his whole life. Sure. You know, and, and he, um, and he would actually disagree with what I'm saying. He, he, he would tie art and writing to a particular place that you have some kind of... But at the same time, Wendell Berry is a very mentally and emotionally stable human being. He's a very moral man. And a lot of artists and writers don't have that sense of homeostasis that he has, which makes them want to go off into the world to create something. So it's probably a bit of both. But I, I think a lot of artists that, have, that need to express themselves have to be in the outside of things. And you'll find this musically too, of sure. course, you know? Um, you have to go out and, and, and make your way away from your own particular background. Right. Yeah. And you find just from a distraction standpoint, obviously culturally it's so different where you're living now and spending your time. Do you find that you'd be able to put the time in if you were in Boston or... or, or yeah, know, no, I... I with everything that's happening? Well, you know... I think I, I think I could probably could do it if I had to if I was here, but it's just I like doing it there better, sure. you know. And the other thing about Aikidos that's helpful to me is that there is Wi-Fi there, uh, but it's not very strong. Right. So it's like using, you know, getting on Facebook is just like a, it takes twenty seconds to to to, to get on the internet on your phone. So the the lack of technological development in the Amazon is helpful in the sense that the speed of things just isn't there. So you're not always on your phone and it's, it's actually good. You know, I come home now and I don't kind of turn my phone off and I, I don't need it anymore. Yeah. You know, and you, and you look or you come home and you see the addiction people have to technology here, which is getting worse and worse and worse. Mm-hmm. And that's part of my writing too, is, is, is looking at the relationship between technology and capitalism and how they're in the process of integrating right now. And to me, this is a very dangerous thing and it's a very, it's very much like a Trojan horse as well. Um, so, when it's very, I mean, the difference in how we use technology from Latin America to here is quite dramatic, quite dramatic. Right. Yeah. 